I will start sharing my screen. Okay. So can you see my slides? Okay, very good. So now that I'm recording, I will start from the beginning and I will welcome everyone. I'm Marisa Kusoko. I'm the uh, director of the Yukon tab and I have here with me Juliana Barrett, who is with the Yukon extension and she is the coordinator and instructor of uh, the climate core assistance program. So today we will tell you a little bit about our Brownfield municipal assistance program and also our sister climate assistance program. So you can also consider um, uh, applying to that if you have needs related to climate climate resilience. So this is what the Yukon tab does at a glance. Um, we uh, provide direct technical assistance, meaning that you can call us, ask questions, ask for um, uh, for document examples. You know, so we can work with you one on one on a short term basis. Uh, today we'll be talking more about the municipal assistance program, which is more like a, a typically three four month long project that uh, we undertake with our municipalities and sometimes it's even longer than that with work with communities for like over the course of a whole year uh, to uh, move a project forward and then we also provide continuing education with webinars and workshops and community engagement so um, if you are new to the tab and you're wondering if we can uh, support you uh, we can serve anyone who is eligible to receive EPA money for a grant. So that includes cities, towns, tribes, nonprofit uh, organizations, community based organizations, economic development agencies, regional planning organizations. So any um, governmental, non governmental entity and um, nonprofit organization. And we are also um, serving all of New England, so uh, all of the six states. So let's get into the municipal assistance program. This is a collaboration between um, you, the community, and your role in this is to provide information to us and input in terms of what, um, you know, what your needs are and how, you know, our, our kind of like steps meet those needs or not. And then uh, TAB staff um, is also intimately involved and does kind of like uh, ultimately uh, the quality control of all the projects and the final reporting. But we also bring in Yukon students. So um, we offer actually two classes. One is related to brownfield redevelopment and the other one is related to climate resilience, where Yukon students spend one semester learning uh, the basics in the classroom. And then they work in a practicum semester where they do an internship with us um, and they work with us and you directly on a project. So it's really a three way collaboration. And our municipal assistance program has three cycles. Uh, the one that we are talking about now is the January through April uh, cycle. These roughly follow the academic semesters uh, here uh, at UConn. So the students that you will be working with will be kind of like working on their spring practicum through, uh, on January through April. So we will accept, we'll be accepting applications for that program through uh, December 15th, I believe, um, and then be in communication with the community so that we can uh, get kickstarted in January. So the types of projects that we provide uh, support for in the Brownfields program include Brownfield inventories, data reviews and gaps analysis for Brownfield sites, draft scopes of work for site investigations, site reuse planning and community engagement planning and materials. And I will go through examples of each of those so you know exactly what, um, what you are getting in, uh, working with us. So let's start with the municipal assistance program. With the, with the brownfield inventories. So uh, this consists in, it's essentially self-explanatory. So we go through lists of sites, um, we do drive-bys, we do kind of like on, online um, uh, uh, inventory analysis uh, to identify brownfield sites in your community. And uh, the deliverables of that is we provide you with an Excel spreadsheet that has detailed um, property information. So as you can see uh, to the down right here, the inventory doesn't include just the name of the site, but also includes information like tax payment, buildings, um, the age of the buildings, uh, what past uses you have, if there are utilities, 
uh, if it's located in a, an opportunity zone, um, the zoning of the site, uh, if there are wetlands. So you get a lot more information uh, that can kind of like live with the site and be updated with uh, the inventory. Uh, we also provide a written report that details the data sources and the findings associated with each of the sites. And um, uh, if you like to use that, we can also provide a map of the identified properties. If you also wish, we can work with you to go through that inventory and identify a prioritization scheme in terms of uh, what you might want to assess first, what you might might want to kind of like go after cleanup funds, you know, uh, that type of thing. And <laughs> that prioritization will be done closely, you know, with you as a community so that um, you have input on what is important, you know, from your, from your standpoint. Data review for specific brownfield sites. So you can think of that as um, a data collection that is similar to a partial phase one investigation. This means that um, we obtain historical sunborn maps and area photos of the sites. Uh, we review previous site documents, any online reports, hazardous waste manifests, past uses that we can find, building inspector archives. Uh, we also do a site visit and provide a detailed description of the uh, physical and environmental setting. And then we use all this, all this information to identify potential areas of concern um, for that site. So essentially what you get out of this is a preliminary phase one. We cannot sign that um, as, a, as an environmental professional because that's not where we are. You know, we are kind of like a students and then a potential service, but it does give you a pretty good sense in terms of like what would a phase one say if you know you were to go to the to a consultant. It also saves a lot of time um, and potentially funds if you choose to go with a formal phase one investigation for that particular site. The data gap analysis is um, uh, essentially a review of previous site investigations. Where you know a, a good example of this is a is a uh, analysis that we did for um, a cluster of sites for the city of Brockton. So they provided us um, with four reports that were done at previous stages. Some you know the the newest one was in 2021, but the oldest one was like in 2009. So we went through four reports that had three or four hundred pages each with environmental investigations and various other types of investigation. And we created a summary that was essentially 12 pages. And that 12 pages included the information that uh, of what are the current site conditions, what are the key environmental concerns that are remaining from the previous investigations, and more or less you know, what we expect might be needed in terms of remediation, any data gaps where additional investigation is needed to make, you know, to have enough, enough data to make remedial um, decisions. And then finally, we provided a potential scope of work and a broad scale of costs to fill the data gaps. So we said, okay, there are kind of like three locations where you need additional testing. You will need approximately 10 soil borings that will cost you like $20,000. So that is the level of information we, we provide. We are not, again, meant to replace an environmental professional who will give you like a detailed scope of work and a detailed cost analysis, but it will essentially take a lot of past information and give you a roadmap on what needs to be done with that site. Okay, the, the next type of project that is, is very popular with um, many communities is a site reuse assessment. Uh, so for that, we identify potential reuse options for a brownfield based on the community's vision and other site and surrounding uh, area conditions. We evaluate opportunities, constraints, and a range of redevelopment possibilities. So we look at property information with respect to ownerships, land value, tax status, zoning, um, different types of uh, constraints like infrastructure, utilities, what does a neighboring lag use, the viability of structures at the site. Uh, we look at the community as a whole, what are the demographics, 
what are the strengths, what are business opportunities, what might the community want on the basis of previous planning. And we cannot do a full market analysis, but we provide a higher level overview of what is the local economy and the regional one, and as well as kind of like the land availability in the vicinity and what um, types of uses that um, might support. So the deliverables include a formal report and it also re includes um, renderings of uh, reuse scenarios that we uh, develop with the communities. And sometimes a community is fairly clear what they want. So they say, well, we really want mixed use here. Can you tell us what that could look like? Sometimes they say, we have no idea what to do with the site. Give, give us some ideas. So it really ranges depending on what your needs are. So let me show you two examples of uh, work that we did on previous sites. Uh, so this is uh, a former power plant um, in Caribou, Maine, and here the site is located on the river, as you can see here from the aerial view of the, on the top left. Um, and this site is actually connected to a lot of recreational trails that the community has. Uh, so their vision is to create a park that will also have some facilities that can be used uh, to create to those tra trails that are used either for ATVs in the, in the summer or for uh, snowmobiles in the winter. And so we kind of like created a vision of what this may look like, you know, how, what the parking is going to be, the um, facilities, bathrooms, dog parks. And so this is kind of like an idea of what the final use is going to look like that then Caribou is using to communicate this vision to the community um, and kind of like do charrettes and things like that. Uh, another example is out of uh, Spofford, New Hampshire. Um, so here uh, there is this, oops, excuse me, the, Formex, the former electronics building. This is a historic building. Uh, this is the current uh, use that you see here on the left. And there is another building here on the right that is meant to be torn down. So um, uh, the site is actually fairly much bigger than this. There is also like... Um, uh, opportunity for open space in the back. I'm only showing you one view here. So essentially what we looked at is um, how the, the building can be converted to a mixed use that includes uh, apartment space at the top, uh, a deli and bakery potentially at the bottom, some other uh, commercial opportunity at the bottom. And then we also showed like how uh, the surrounding space can be, um, uh, can be changed to support um, uh, recreational opportunities, a farmer's market, um, uh, food trucks, so something that can work also uh, with the recreational trails that are adjacent to that site. As you can see, it is also right next to a, to a little brook. Um, so that is the visual part of what you're getting from the report, but the report also itself goes into the details of, of what assumptions we used, what are the zoning constraints, you know, like what does it take to, to make this happen. Uh, finally, we work on communities on, on community on meaningful community engagement. And this uh, we, we utilize our seeds framework. So we can work with you on various aspects of this. The first part of uh, S is identifying community stakeholders. So um, figure out essentially who you want to reach and who are important players in your community that you want to engage. Then we help you uh, uh, create and utilize educational materials to, to communicate with your stakeholders, to empower them to take resources um, to, to the community, uh, teach them, uh, and then finally determine an approach that will last beyond kind of like all phases of the brownfield redevelopment. So some examples of what we have done in the past is we create like a Brownfields 101 that you can use for your website. We can do a workshop where we come and talk to the community about the Brownfields uh, 101. So kind of like provide an, a citizen's introduction. Uh, then uh, we help organizing charrettes and workshops, um, uh, advertise the events, um, have kind of like active interactive um, and materials during that and then um, communicate the results back to your, you know, back to the, your community at large. Uh, so we can help you have like a whole community website that includes all the materials, including um, the, the, what comes out of the workshops, surveys, um, forms that you might want to use, um, 
or, or any other visual materials. Uh, this is another example of a type of website that we use, uh, that we created for Mount Trashmore in um, Bridgeport. So you don't see the whole thing here, but this is a whole story map where you can scroll down and see, you know, what the timeline and the history is of that particular brownfield site and what the vision for the community is. And then finally, we can also provide a written community engagement plan. So the idea here is that we will create a document that tells you what to do. Uh, so this was done for Bethlehem, New Hampshire, and, and this was an analysis of who lives in the community, what means of communication do they use, what are the most effective ways to um, to do outreach and then kind of like a step by step plan of how to use that throughout the redevelopment process of a particular brownfield. So that's all I had and I will, now I will pass it on to uh, Juliana who will talk about the climate core. Great. Thank you so much, Marissa. So, similar to the tab program, um, we have a Yukon climate core. These are mainly juniors and seniors at Yukon. Um, they take a fall course on the climate on climate impacts and adaptation, and we bring it very quickly down to the regional level. So New England, um, and if we can get more specific, we do. Um, we go into how government works, local governments work, um, as well as the opportunities and the barriers to moving adaptation projects forward. Uh, and then in the spring semester, students do an independent study. Um, if you want to go on to the next slide, Marissa. Um, thank you. So it, this is our practicum semester from mid-January through April. Um, students can sign up for this independent study uh, where they do projects related to climate adaptation with community partners. Those partners can be, we've had federal government, state government, municipal government, beach associations, nonprofits. Um, really anyone across the board, uh, as long as it's focused on climate adaptation. And in connection with the brownfields, um, we thought it would be really exciting for students to work on some climate adaptation aspect um, with one of the brownfield projects. Um, and so students have done vulnerability assessments they could look at specifics in terms of flooding, precipitation events, storm events, if it's coastal, sea level rise, heat, wind, any of those impacts associated with climate change. So students um, can put together educational materials on those impacts, um, what residents or the community might, might do in terms of options. Um, resilience planning for a particular site, whether it's a natural area or a developed area, um, business planning for um, flooding, for example. So lots of opportunities, lots of um, potential, and it'd be great to see some synergies between working with the brownfields and uh, climate adaptation. And I put my contact information there if anybody wants to get in touch with me um, about any of the, the climate core work. So, thank you. Thank you, Juliana, and I will say that this is particularly timely uh, since EPA is putting more and more emphasis on climate resilience for uh, a brownfield sites. Uh, it's now kind of like a, a part that uh, one needs to address uh, when you, you're putting together grant proposals. And so, uh, we can kind of like help you think this through, you know, and develop plans, you know, as uh, as part of, of the whole redevelopment process. Uh, as the last thing, I will um, make sure that you know where to go uh, to, um, to go to apply for the municipal assistance program. Um, if you're not sure, you can always email us at yukon.tab uh, at yukon.edu. Uh, you can go on our website where is the information and the link to the municipal assistance program. I will also put this, I will show you the website and put this um, in the chat right now. So this is what the request for proposals looks like. All we ask is kind of like your contact, what kind of is your entity, where you are, uh, a little bit of, you know, how um, much you know about Brownfields in, in, in the community, um, and then what type of proposal you're looking for help with, 
And then additional details on the project, it's kind of like some open-ended as, for example, oh, we have the former XYZ site and we want to do uh, this type of thing for it, you know. Um, so it doesn't have to be, you know, very long. We're just looking for a few sentences that summarizes for us um, what, the, what your project is about. And then um, you hit submit. And then we will contact you uh, to have an initial meeting with you, make sure that you know that we kind of like understand the scope of your project, what kind of information you have or you might need, so we get um, ready for uh, the spring semester. So I will stop sharing and I will put my, I will put this link for uh, the request for proposals on the, uh, in the chat, and I am happy to take any questions that you have. Hi, Marissa, I have a quick question for you. Uh, Ryan Curley, Portland. I think we had met back in August. Uh, we did, yes. Remember. Yes, thank yes, you for doing this again. And I'm just wondering, uh, the town of Portland is interested in applying for a, a bar grant uh, with DECD. Is that something that this would be able to be helpful with? And if so, what, what should we be applying? Like, what boxes should we, we be checking off on the application? Uh, so, great question. You can check other and write um, in the just the details, you know, town of Portland bar grant, and I will know what it is. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We are, we are happy to help with any state funding um, that, you know, you're, you're going after. We know that mark that mark grant season is done. But there may be state opportunities or other opportunities that um, uh, you're looking for, or you may even be looking at something like, um, you know, funding stormwater funding for a brownfield site. So as long as it's related to brownfield to a brownfield site, we can help with um, with that process. That is kind of like the one the one requirement that a brownfield has to somehow be involved in the in the project. I have a question. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Nancy Martin from Portland, Maine. And I just want to be sure I heard correctly about how an inventory could work. I mean, we're we're for New England, a relatively large city. That's all relative, of course. But could you literally do an inventory of the entire city to find eligible sites? Or I, I want to be sure I understand. Um, if we're looking for something that is not site specific, but more about what is our potential universe, is that something that you can help with? Yes, we do brownfield brownfield inventories for whole cities. Cool. And depending on the scale of the city, we work with very small municipalities that may have three or five or ten sites, and we work with the city of Bridgeport that had four hundred. Um, and obviously, the four, I mean, for the for the one that was four hundred, we actually did it over multiple cycles because it was just a very large project. Um, and, and typically when we are dealing with a, with a bigger city, we kind of like take a stepwise approach. We see what's on your radar, you know, we, so we find like kind of like different sources and we may give you additional sites in waves, so to speak, but yes, we, we do citywide inventories. Or even maybe like neighborhood by neighborhood. To be Absolutely, to yes. Okay, yes. that's really helpful, thank you. And we did meet back in Maine, right? Yes, you that's had right. The, you had the, the spreadsheet, the Excel spreadsheet. Uh, yes, thank uh, you for yes. sharing that. That's really useful. Yeah, yeah. Great. Any other questions? So we have uh, several motivated students who are, um, and also additional full-time interns that work with us for the spring semester. Uh, we are, you know, very, very eager to be working with uh, people across the across the, the region. It does not matter where you are, we will come and do site visits. And, you know, we, we also have the funding to kind of like have the students stay overnight and, you know, work with you. So it's not, um, do not feel that if you're not in Connecticut, we are not going to be there. We're absolutely going to be there. Any other questions? Okay, very good. So please click on the link. Uh, our uh, uh, preferred deadline is uh, December 15th so that we can have kind of like the roster of uh, communities that we're going to work with. 
so that we can start start setting up meetings at the beginning of January and kind of like making sure everything is lined up for uh, for the spring semester. And uh, I will also put Juliana's email in the chat again. But if for whatever reason you don't have it, if you email UConTab, we will be able to connect you. And the, the recording of this is also going to be available on our website. All right. Very nice to see you all. Thank you so much for your time and hope to be working with you uh, in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.